Okay, shall we start? It's time. Uh, good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you may be. Uh, welcome all to the second of this five-part webinar series on a new corporate concept of the corporation, jointly hosted by Research Institute of Economy, Trade and Industry, European Corporate Governance Institute, and Waseda University Institute of Business and Finance, WBF. My name is Iko Suzuki, and I am Associate Director of WBF and Research Member of ECGI. Today, we have four distinct speakers and commentators from the UK, Australia, Germany, and Japan. My colleagues, Professors Hideaki Miyajima and Marco Becht will chair the session. But before that, I would like to make a short pre presentation about who we are. Waseda University was founded in 1882 by Shigenobu Okuma, a renowned statesman who served as the Prime Minister of Japan. It is one of the oldest private universities in Japan. WBF Institute is an affiliated research institute of Waseda Business School, which holds accreditation from both AACSP and Equis, the only business school to do so in Japan. WBF provides research on and executive education for business and finance communities in Japan and hosts a series of seri uh, seminars and conferences inviting researchers from around the world. To our participants from abroad uh, who are watching, we always welcome you to present your research or collaborate with the faculty when you visit Tokyo next time once COVID-19 crisis is overcome. So don't hesitate to contact us if you are interested. With this short statement, I'll hand over to Professor Hideaki Miyajima, who will explain the theme of this second webinar. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, uh, thank you for participating in the webinar series of a new concept of the cooperation. Um, so I'm Hideaki Miyajima, uh, organizer of this webinar series, and uh, let me give uh, you a few words uh, on the motivation uh, behind this uh, seminar, uh, webinar series. So over the last few years, uh, particularly since the onset of COVID-19, the purpose of the cooperation has been the subject of uh, active debate. And on the occasion of the publication of the Japanese translation of the Korean book, uh, Prosperity, so this was a uh, Japanese version of the uh, Korean book, uh, our uh, institute, WBF and RIETI and ECGI uh, jointly organized uh, to uh, uh, this uh, webinar series. Uh, the message uh, of Corinne's book is uh, extremely clear uh, that instead of former shareholder value maximization, uh, let us uh, set the solving the problem uh, with a profitable way as a purpose of the cooperation. So uh, this uh, statement uh, then uh, raises several uh, questions. So why uh, is it possible to say uh, so uh, under the uh, market economy where the uh, company in uh, serious product market competition? And Corin answers this question historically and philosophically in his book, as well as uh, giving us some uh, remarks on uh, first uh, seminar series. Then, uh, Another uh, question uh, which we see uh, the statement is uh, how to realize a new concept of cooperation or to create the purposeful farms. Uh, in his book, uh, Corin suggested that ownership structure, governance and law accounting system, a strategy and organization should be uh, coherently created uh, for the a new concept or ideas are in the new concept of the cooperation. And in our seminar series, uh, we are trying to uh, show uh, this problem, um, mainly focusing on law and governance issues, uh, especially the role of board, di uh, di uh, board of directors. 
And issue of episode two is uh, mainly uh, covered to these questions. First question is the conceptual difference uh, between the enlightened shareholders view and the new concept of the corporation. So here the problem is uh, how to understand the meaning of to solve the problem uh, profitable ways. And second uh, point to be discussed is how to answer the funding criticism from the conventional view, uh, such as the measurement issues or uh, manager discretion uh, problem, or how to solve the trade-off uh, between uh, stakeholders. And the Collins and the commentator uh, will touch upon these issues. And third problem, uh, which uh, this episode two will address is how to realize the new concept of cooperation in a current corporate law context. So almost everywhere, uh, the cooperation law, uh, corporate law defined to protect the interest of company as the duty of the loyalty of the directors. However, the interpretation of the definition of interest of the company uh, differed among uh, countries. So in the US and the UK corporate law, uh, we are the interest of company, in fact, mean the long-term shareholders value maximization. But the other country is different. And uh, the new concept of corporation might be clearly opposed to the uh, duty of uh, loyalty in the US and the UK sense. Then the question is, what is the statutory situation in other countries? And uh, what is the uh, evolution in the US and the UK? So fourth issue is the role of uh, board of directors. So a conventional view is the monitoring CEO for the uh, protecting uh, the shareholders' value. But new concept is the uh, judging trade-off the corporation uh, faced uh, by its corporate purposes or values. Then uh, this understanding lays the question that who selects the monitors and who monitors directors. And in this context, what the current situation like in the US and the UK uh, would be also a very interesting point. And uh, last topic of the episode of two, uh, two is the implication uh, to Japanese corporate governance uh, issues. So according to the book, would have a rich implication to Japan, uh, such as the uh, the interpretation of the uh, interest of a corporation or a role of director or future of the J-type stakeholder models. So uh, we can uh, expect to have a lot of the uh, opinion uh, on this implication uh, from our uh, following session. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Miyajima. Uh, we'd like to start with the uh, Colin Mayer uh, from the University of Oxford about his presentation on the this uh, episode two. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor Suzuki and Professor Miyajima for the introduction. I'm going to share my screen, which I hope you can see now. So, the first session in this series looked at the issue of the purpose of a company. And in that, I set out the notion of the purpose as going beyond the traditional Friedman view as it being about increasing profits so long as companies stay within the rules of the game to a recognition that a purpose is about the existence of a company and why it's created. And the notion of purpose that was put forward in the first session was the notion that companies are there to solve problems, to solve problems in a particular way. And that is in a way that is commercially viable, financially sustainable and profitable. 
And so the way in which in my book, I define the purpose of a company is to produce profitable solutions to the problems of people and planet, not profiting from producing problems for either. Now, both those parts of the notion of a purpose will be important in what we're going to discuss today, which is going to focus on the role of law in creating purposeful businesses. So one of the questions that arose in the first session was, well, if it's about profitable solutions, how does that really differ from what Friedman had in mind? And the answer that I gave then was that it's in part a matter of causality. That is to say, within the traditional view, the company is motivated by maximizing profits and the welfare properties follow from that in the context of competitive markets or regulation where markets fail. The issue that that raises is what happens when there are both market failures and regulatory failures, as we've observed a great deal of over the last few years. The view that comes out of this notion of purpose is that profits are not the purpose per se of a corporation. They are the product of the process of solving problems. And that difference in causality is extremely important when we come on to the context within law, where the law defines the notion of the existence of the company. The law creates a corporate form. So in this context, companies are identifying solve problems that they can solve and defining a business model to solve those problems. And that notion of this purpose as being about business models to solve problems in ways that are profitable is a distinctive notion of this context of profits and is important when we come on to think about measurement issues. So businesses should be structuring their activities in such a way as to be able to deliver those solutions and to be sure that they do so in a profitable form where those profits are not a reflection of delivering problems as against solutions. So that is a key element in terms of measurement that profits should be measured after the costs associated with remedying any problems that a firm creates. Now one can think about this in the context of existing law. And this is an example of how it's specified under a UK company law that a director of a company must act in the way that he considers in good faith would be most likely to promote the success of the company for the benefit of its members as a whole. Now, the law in Britain goes on then to introduce what is often described as being an enlightened shareholder value approach to specifying a company by saying that, and in doing this, it should have regard, or he should have regard to the likely consequences of any decision in the long term. In other words, the notion of the success of the company is over the long term and its impact on other stakeholders. And then there's a list of a number of stakeholders that might be relevant in terms of promoting the success of the company. So the enlightened notion comes from the fact that directors should take account of the interests of other stakeholders in the process of promoting the success of the company for the benefit of its members. So, what happens in the context of a traditional view of the firm is that law defines the fiduciary responsibilities of directors 
as promoting the success of the company for the benefits of its shareholders. Corporate governance is then about addressing the agency problem that arises in terms of the alignment of the interests of management with those of their shareholders. Regulation is there to protect a number of parties who might otherwise be exposed to the activities of the company, in particular minority shareholders, creditors, customers, and society at large. And the company then maximizes its shareholder value while conforming to legal requirements and in particular regulatory requirements. Now it's often argued that the law in this context is permissive in allowing companies to pursue activities that promote the success of the firm. They can adopt any structures they like in so doing, and they can measure their performance as they feel appropriate in terms of delivering that success of the company so long as they uphold the regulatory and legal requirements. But what one observes in practice is that companies nevertheless have primary regard for their shareholders. They adopt structures that promote shareholder interests. They measure their performance predominantly in relation to their shareholders. They incentivize management accordingly. They go as far as they can in terms of minimizing the impact of regulation. And in particular, in the presence of markets for corporate control, shareholder activism, takeovers, et cetera, they're exposed to shareholder interventions that uh, are designed to address failures of directors to pursue the interests of their shareholders above any other. Now, what this uh, does is to essentially raise a question of, well, how enlightened can uh, directors really be? And recently, um, a lot of emphasis has been placed on directors recognizing their responsibilities under law, which requires them to demonstrate that they are promoting the interests of their stakeholders, so long as that, that enhances the interests of the success of the company for their shareholders, and they should report on how they're fulfilling their obligations under it. And increasingly, corporate governance is being designed to ensure that there is an alignment between directors' responsibilities under the law and how they actually act in practice. Beyond this, there are a number of different models of the firm that have emerged. In particular, in the US, there is the notion of the public benefit company, which requires companies to articulate and uphold public as well as private uh, interests, public interests beyond that of just promoting shareholder financial returns. In Europe, there are a number of different models that place greater emphasis on stakeholders, granting stakeholders various voting rights, board seats, representation on councils and oversight bodies. Uh, in some countries, there are models that privilege certain classes of shareholders, particularly in some of the Nordic countries, there's been a great deal of emphasis on dual class shares. In Japan, traditionally, there was the, uh, the bank uh, ownership model, which then gave rise to the cross shareholding model uh, of the 21st century, where companies hold shares in each other. Contrast, the UK and the US model has been the outside shareholder model uh, in which there are restrictions on dual class shares, very strong minority protection, and the reforms that have been undertaken uh, in the Abe period have been to emphasize uh, the breakup of cross shareholdings and the role of outside shareholders in some ways along the lines of a UK and US model. Now, in thinking about the relationship with purposeful companies, it's important to understand the notions that surround corporate law and regulation. Corporate law is basically enabling in allowing companies 
to adopt different forms, as I was describing in the context of the UK company's law, and it empowers various different parties to engage in the governance of firms, employees, investors, customers, and communities as companies see appropriate and to allow them to enforce their rights through voting, representation, and various forms of public engagement. Now, the importance of this is that in thinking about the purpose of a company, at present, the interests of shareholders are paramount because although the directors have a duty to promote the success of the company, ultimately, it's the shareholders who determine what is meant by the success of the company and the pursuit of a purpose that goes beyond that is then restricted by that notion of what is ultimately uh, shareholder value maximizing for companies. If we think about purposes beyond that, we need to think about ways in which companies can commit to purposes that place emphasis on parties that may uh, include others than the shareholders themselves. Regulation requires minimum standards and imposes minimum obligations of, on companies. Uh, it causes companies to refrain from certain activities and certain purposes that may be deemed to be against the social interest. And it, they require companies to restore uh, harms that they may do through paying compensation or through undertaking remedial actions. So within the context of a purposeful company, the way in which uh, the system should operate is that companies, first of all, define their purposes along the lines of what I was talking about in terms of solving problems profitably, not profiting from producing problems. The law should facilitate the adoption of that, those arrangements that promote corporate purposes and allow companies to commit to them. Corporate governance should allow companies to align their structures and the way in which they conduct their activities with their purposes and to ensure that they are meeting their obligations to their various different parties in terms of delivering on their purpose. Regulation can assist companies with conforming with social norms by aligning the purposes of companies with those social licenses to operate in those cases where companies are of a regulated form. In, for example, utilities, banks, and some public service companies, then regulation may be used to align purposes with social norms elsewhere. One wants to encourage as much competition as, po as possible. And companies then should be evaluated against fulfillment of their purposes. So in this context, corporate law requires companies to articulate their purposes and potentially incorporate them in their articles of association as a way of committing to those purposes. Directors then have a fiduciary responsibility to fulfill those purposes and they have to demonstrate critically how the ownership and governance, the way in which they measure their performance, the incentives within the organization promote their purposes. And that is critical because being able to commit to these constitutions and structures that align ownership and governance with purposes is the way in which companies can then demonstrate to other parties that they, as part of their purposes, will fulfill the delivery of those purposes and can demonstrate it's credible for them to do that. And they should evaluate their success then and measure their success against achieving those purposes. What uh, regulation does in this context is to set minimum standards that should apply to all companies uh, and it restrains companies from undertaking activities that may be against the public interest. And as I mentioned, in the case of some companies, utilities, banks, companies with significant market power, one may want to align their particular purposes with the public interest, in particular in those sectors 
such as utilities that are regulated. This, in essence, requires public service companies to adopt social license to, to operate in their articles of association or their regulatory licenses. Now, in thinking about the implications of this for uh, Japan, uh, and indeed for uh, countries around the world, it's important to recognize that what this does is it promotes a multiplicity of purposes of companies. It encourages corporate diversity in allowing companies to say, well, they may want to be companies that pursue just shareholder interests and maximize their profits, and there should be nothing to stop them doing that. But they should be clear that that is what their purpose is and that they've structured their company in such a way to do that. Others may have other purposes and they will structure their uh, businesses in different forms that allow them to implement those uh, different purposes. It promotes corporate success. Corporate success in the way in which we mean it. The notion of profit where one can profit at the expense of other parties is not really a profit at all. Uh, it is in essence a form of wealth transfer. When one thinks about what is a real profit, and we'll talk about this more in the session on measurement, a profit is one where companies should be profiting to the benefit of all parties, not inflicting detriments on some. It allows companies to commit credibly. It encourages reciprocal obligations between, for example, employees in terms of supporting employees in return for commitments on the part of employees to invest their human assets uh, in companies and to make investments in companies that are specific to the companies for which they're working because they know that those companies are committed to them. It encourages investor engagement because it makes clear what is the purpose of the company against which investors should be evaluating companies. It promotes productive regulation that encourages an alignment of purposes of companies and regulated sectors with the public interest. And it addresses many of the critical questions that have arisen in Japan since the banking crisis in terms of low growth, productivity, lack of investment, because what it does is it encourages a community of interests within the firms in terms of suppliers, employees and investors working towards promoting the success of the company in terms of delivering benefits where those benefits are accruing to all parties, not just restricted to one particular party, namely shareholders in many cases at the expense of other parties, for example, the environment or society in terms of the degree of inclusivity of other parts of society. It encourages a greater resilience on the part of companies because it makes them less exposed to regulatory interventions or to uh, failures because of environmental problems. It retains societal benefits at the heart of what a company is there to do very much in line with the traditional view of a corporation within Japan. It retains a long-term perspective uh, and it places perhaps greater emphasis on environmental factors as well as societal factors than has traditionally been the case in Japan. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Colin, uh, for your excellent presentation. The, uh, yes, it certainly has the, uh, the impact on, on Japan in many senses. So uh, our second speaker is uh, Professor Jennifer Phil Hill from uh, Monash University. Uh, just a small, short introduction that she's a professor uh, and Bob Back's chair, corporate uh, commercial law at uh, Monash University. And she's uh, from the law and legal studies uh, side. So she's going to present a view from the, the legal scholars uh, about uh, the presentation of Colin. Uh, please, Jennifer. Professor Suzuki and Professor Miyajima, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be joining you. And uh, Colin, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, so greetings from Australia. Uh, in the brief time that I have available today, what I would like to do is to try to position 
uh, Collins' theory of the corporation within legal history and legal theory. And I want to show how important his theory uh, is within that traditional history. I also want to discuss some of the implications for this theory for directors and the tension uh, between different models in terms of what directors are supposed to do. And then I want to discuss whether the law and other corporate governance developments are able to be an adequate match uh, between this new concept of what directors are supposed to do and what the law requires. So this session is about fiduciary duties and the new conception of the corporation. I am always somewhat skeptical when I hear about anything new in corporate law, because if legal history tells us anything, it's that things go in cycles in legal history and everything old can become new again. And indeed, if we go back a hundred years uh, to the seminal 1932 text, The Modern Corporation and Private Property, we find that Professors Burley and Means recognized in that, that text that the modern public corporation is a profoundly ambiguous entity that straddles the divide between public and private law. And they considered that in the future, it could go in either direction. Um, and what I think we're seeing here with uh, Professor Mayer's work is a swing towards the more public model that they talked about. Um, that same era, of course, when they were writing a uh, hundred years ago, there was also an incredibly important and tremendous academic debate about the nature of the corporation and what the corporation uh, was in theory, whether it was a mere aggregation, a contractual arrangement between natural persons, or whether it should be viewed holistically. And I know that Katya is going to talk about this in some of her comments later on. There was a, a, a great stop to the theoretical debate uh, in 1926 with a very famous article in the Yale Law Journal where Professor John Dewey, um, who very famous philosopher, said that either of the two theories of the corporation, either as a public entity or a private entity, could be manipulated instrumentally to achieve either end. And so no one talked about corporate theory for around 50 years until that is the 1980s, when the law and economics theory uh, really broke new ground and came back, corporate theory came back into vogue. And the rise of the law and economics theory brought back the concept of the corporation as an inherently private contractual entity uh, that was nothing more than a legal fiction, that it was just a nexus of contracts for flesh and blood people associated with the corporation. So, as I mentioned, I think that one of the things that's terribly important about Professor Mayer's work is we are now seeing this shift away from that 1980s law and economics model of the corporation to the more public conception that Burley and Means foresaw. So what, what are the implications of the different models of the corporation, this private model on the one hand, as opposed to a more public model, for what we expect of directors, for directors' duties and for corporate governance generally. Well, uh, ever since another very famous debate in the 1930s, the Burley-Dodd debate, uh, we've seen that there can be a real tension in terms of what is expected of directors, depending on which of these theories is adopted. And since at least the 1960s or the 1970s in the US, um, the work of Professor Melvin Eisenberg has shown us that the modern view of directors is that they are corporate monitors. Um, and that has really driven a very important corporate governance development around the world, the idea of independent directors who are there to monitor what is going on in the corporation. However, as another equally famous American academic, Professor Victor Brudney once said, that is an ambiguous notion, the idea of directors as monitors, until you know what they are supposed to be monitoring. And Professor Brudney put forward three possible things that directors could be there to monitor. Firstly, integrity. Secondly, financial performance and efficiency. And thirdly, corporate social responsibility. 
And as Colin has shown us very clearly, the traditional, the orthodox financial um, view of the corporation takes the second of these monitoring roles. It says that the whole role of the corporation is financial performance and efficiency, and that is also the role of the directors to ensure that the corporation behaves in an efficient uh, and, and performs well. Uh, it's also been said that between 1995 and 2013, Professor Ron Gilson has pointed out that during that time, 25% of all articles in the Journal of Financial Economist, uh, Economics uh, were about corporate governance. And they all had that perspective that corporate governance was solely about financial performance or efficiency. Now, to my mind, that is a legitimate concern. It's particularly a legitimate concern in an era of what's been described as forced capitalism, when in many jurisdictions throughout the world, members of the public and employees uh, have become involuntary investors in capital markets as a result of their pension funds, their retirement savings. So those people care about how financial markets perform. But there's a second major problem in corporate law, which that private model of the corporation, uh, the financial economics model, just seem to overlook. And that is uh, that corporations can create negative externalities and harm to society. And it's this second problem that I think comes to the forefront in, in Colin's work uh, and comes to the forefront in a number of recent corporate scandals. And um, what I think Colin's work shows is that a single-minded focus on financial performance is at best incomplete and at worst completely misguided. And so the second problem has a more nuanced role for directors uh, than the old profit maximization mantra. It focuses on how profits are made and in particular, whether they are made by creating negative externalities as a result of flawed corporate culture. And it's worth noting that solutions to the first problem of financial performance can actually exacerbate those problems in the second set, set of problems. Uh, and so, as Colin said, a lot of our corporate governance in the last couple of decades has been designed to address the first problem. And that has actually exacerbated the second set of problems. And uh, what are the implications of this for directors? Well, I think it shows that we now have a conception that directors' role is much more uh, a broader remit than simply making profits. It does include this uh, looking at how those profits are made and ensuring that those profits are not made uh, by harming society. So they bring into play the, the more modern view of, of directors' responsibilities, bring into play those ideas of integrity and corporate social responsibility that were alternate possible roles uh, for directors under Professor Bradney's uh, matrix. Now, a number of recent scandals have really highlighted, I think, this second problem in corporate law, this idea that Colin puts forward of not profiting at the expense of others. Now, of course, some profiting at the expense of others is fine. Uh, it's behind the whole idea of competition. Uh, you know, you, you perform better than your competitors and that's fine. But creating negative externalities, uh, creating social harm is obviously problematic. And we've seen several international scandals, including in my own country, where this second problem has really come to the forefront. Uh, scandals in the financial sector, such as with Wells Fargo Bank in America, and many of you will be aware that Australia in 2019 had a banking royal commission as a result of banking scandals there. And some really important points, I think, came out in that royal commission. Um, the royal commission, no problems in terms of profitability of the banks, they were raking in money. However, the question was how they had achieved this. 
And the Banking Royal Commission found that perverse remuneration incentives in the banks created flawed corporate cultures where huge profits were made by damaging the interests of customers and at the expense of organisational integrity. And indeed, a report by Australia's prudential regulator, APRA, said that in one of the banks, um, the ongoing financial success of the bank had dulled the senses of senior management uh, to non-financial risks and compliant, non-compliance with anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism laws. Interestingly, in the COVID era that followed that Banking Royal Commission, uh, the Australian banks shifted greatly towards trying to solve the problems of COVID. Uh, and that was very much an attempt at redemption and an attempt to restore public trust and their reputations uh, by helping the public. So I want to ask now the question of to what extent do directors' duties and other corporate governance techniques match the evolving expectations we have for company directors in regard to these uh, you know, corporations not harming society? Colin's taken us through some of the, the key director's duties in the UK, so I won't repeat those except to say that I totally agree that they are permissive. Uh, it means directors can pursue other interests but are not required to, to do so. Um, nonetheless, I would say that director's duties don't operate in a vacuum uh, in modern corporate governance. And there are a number of other corporate governance guardrails that I think are imbuing directors with the sort of norms that appear in Colin's work. And so I want to talk about two of those, corporate governance codes and stewardship codes. Um, they're non-binding, they are not like fiduciary duties, and yet they are able to imbue fiduciary duties with certain norms that society expects and transmit those societal expectations to directors. The other thing about these codes is they are constantly evolving. And one of the things that we're seeing in that evolution is a much greater emphasis on a corporation's social role and responsibilities. And I have no doubt that some of these, um, it, some of this evolution, for example, in the 2018 UK Corporate Governance Code is actually a reflection of the impact of Colin's work. Um, but in that code, the 2018 UK Code, uh, it notes that the role of a successful company and its directors uh, is not only to create value for shareholders, but to contribute to wider society. That corporate governance code also pays greater attention to the participatory rights of employees. So it goes beyond section 172, the section that Colin was talking about, which is just about protecting stakeholder rights if the directors feel like it. This actually gives employees a participatory role. We see a similar development in Germany, where the German Corporate Governance Code stresses the responsibility of the enterprise to society as a whole, and also the importance of social and environmental factors for successful companies. Stewardship codes, they are a more recent uh, arrival on the corporate governance scene than uh, corporate governance codes. Uh, and I think they have quite a lot of potential to act as guardrails for directors. I know that Colin regards shareholder stewardship as very in inferior to the idea of trusteeship, but I think sometimes they can overlap and potentially blur. Shareholder stewardship codes have now spread around the world. Um, they started in the UK post corporate uh, global financial crisis. Uh, and they also spread to Japan very quickly after that. But the UK and the Japanese stewardship codes had very different goals. Uh, the UK code was primarily to provide a check on excessive risk taking that emerged in the global financial crisis. Whereas in Japan, uh, it was brought in to provide a warmer climate for shareholder activism, particularly uh, institutional investors, foreign institutional investors to improve the performance of Japanese companies. Many of these stewardship codes are now uh, 
acknowledging, I think, a more public conception of the corporation. This is very clear in the 2020 uh, UK Stewardship Code, which has far greater social and public protection role than earlier stewardship codes, which primarily focused on shareholder interests. The more recent version uh, really looks at the impact of corporations on society, ESG issues, including climate change. And that's something that the big institutional investors such as BlackRock and the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund say they are extremely concerned about. Well, of course, there's a big gap often between rhetoric and reality in this regard. Uh, and the recent controversy concerning Danon, uh, I think has confirmed the fears of many that shareholder activists will undermine social and sustainability goals. However, in Australia in 2019, uh, no, I think last year, um, we had a much more upbeat uh, version of shareholder activism in relation to an ESG related matter at the mining company Rio Tinto. And this involved um, a, a really quite a devastating uh, action by the mining company where they blasted the Duke and Gorge in Western Australia, destroying important uh, Aboriginal cultural heritage site there. And in late 2020, institutional investors became involved in this and they ultimately forced the removal of the CEO and other CEO, uh, other senior executives in the company. Uh, and it appears to be a sort of transnational version of Professor Gilson and Gordon's concept of agency capitalism, because the Australian uh, superannuation or pension funds became involved first, and then they brought in the UK institutional investors to put pressure on Rio Tinto um, and to achieve this outcome. And it's had a whole reflection of uh, ramifications since then. Legal liability, I, I won't say much about that, except to say that I think that there is the potential for director and officer liability for creating externalities and social harm. I think there's a, a much greater potential of that in my own country. Uh, regulators have said that company directors who uh, ignore climate change do so at their peril uh, because we have a public director's duty enforcement regime. And I think there are also some interesting uh, cases coming out of the Delaware Supreme Court, which suggests that uh, when companies create incentives which conflict with their social obligations, for example, in relation to environment or food safety laws, then it is possible that the directors will be liable for their over breach of their oversight duty. And that is a fraying of the traditional protection of directors. So just in wrapping up my presentation, just a few brief closing remarks about Collins' theory. I think it's a very important theory because it comes out of financial economics background, which has basically agreed with the orthodoxy for many, many decades. Um, it's also important because it's a holistic theory rather than an aggregate theory of the corporation. Um, and Colin made this point in the first session. He said, this is, his is not a stakeholder theory of the corporation. And I know Katja is going to make some other comments on this. Secondly, I, I know Colin doesn't see his model as an aspirational model, but I think it is a very powerful aspirational model which has the potential to create new norms for corporations. I like it very much the fact that it is a hopeful view of the corporation. Since at least the beginning of the 17th century, the corporation has been described as soulless and as lacking a moral compass. Um, I like the fact that Colin tells us it may have a moral compass if we can just harness it. Um, I think the big challenge will be accountability. I think this is the big challenge for stakeholder theories of the corporation. I'm profoundly skeptical that it can be achieved in stakeholder theories. I hope it can be achieved with this theory. 
Um, and how does Colin's work intersect with Milton Friedman? Well, as Colin has noted, Milton Friedman tends to be the poster child for the old orthodox profit maximization theory. And yet even he said that corporations should make profits as long as they stayed within the rules of the game. What I think Colin's work shows us is that not only is the theory of the corporation changing to be a more public facing theory, but so too are the rules of the game. The law is still playing catch up with that, but undoubtedly it has to catch up with those social expectations. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer, for uh, excellent comments. Uh, it seems like camera is off, so I haven't turned it on yet, sorry. The, uh, um, the next speaker, the, or rather the commentator uh, we invited is uh, Professor Dr. Katja Langenbucher. Uh, from uh, Goethe University's House of Finance uh, in Frankfurt. Uh, please, uh, uh, Kachi. Thank you very much, Professor Suzuki and Miyajima for giving me the opportunity to comment on Colin's really fascinating book in the context of the German debate. Now in chapter four, Colin contrasts the UK, the US, Japan and Germany, highlighting how differences in historical developments have set these countries on varying paths and today shaped their corporate and securities law. So I'd like to add three comments on that and also three questions. The first is about what Colin calls purpose and commitment forms part of core principles of German corporate law. The second takes up Colin's thoughts on how corporate law creates a separate entity beyond the sum of its shareholders and connects this to German developments in the last century. My third comment is a cultural one, and it'll lead us to the challenges faced by the European Union um, as to its task of building a capital markets union. I'll start with purpose and commitment. Colin encourages us to put purpose rather than traditional topics such as shareholder value or principal agent conflicts in the center of the debate on corporate governance and on corporate law more generally. And when I teach corporations to German law students, we start with partnerships and with what German law understands as three basic requirements for allowing a new legal entity to come into existence. Some form of a contractual basis a common purpose, and a personal duty to commit to this common purpose. Now, in this way, purpose and commitment shape partnerships. In other words, a structure in which owners undertake some form of personal responsibility for the new entity they build. Of course, when we move from partnerships to more anonymous structures, such as limited partnerships, corporations, and then listed stock companies, we understand how personal commitment of the owners to support the common purpose loses significance. But at the same time, the nature of their ownership changes from a personal to a limited partner, a shareholder, and then an investor. Hence, an unsurprisingly commitment, as I understand Colin, is the corporation's, not the owner's commitment. However, is this the only way to understand commitment? One of the characteristics of traditional German corporate law scholarship is the attempt to work out common principles holding true for small personal partnership, as well as for a large listed stock corporation, quite an ambition. Interestingly, commitment has its place among those core principles. For partnerships, it comes in the form of the duty to support the common purpose in a variety of ways. On the other end of the spectrum, for the listed stock corporation, German law still includes traces of this personal commitment. Because shareholders are understood as committed to the corporation's purpose, they are under a duty of loyalty both horizontally, so to other shareholders, and vertically to the corporation. And courts have used this doctrine of vertical duties of loyalty, for example, to block votes in the General Assembly, which were understood to be unconscionable. 
Let me move on to my second remark on how Colin describes a corporation as more than the sum of its shareholders. Just like Jennifer, I'll go back um, in time to 1927, when a well-known paper by Walter Rathenau stressed the distinction between on the one hand shareholder owners and on the other hand, a corporation they built. Now, while most of the world has been focusing on juxtaposing owners and managers, German corporate law has traditionally contrasted shareholders and managers on the one hand and the corporation on the other hand. Going back still to 1927, one of Rathenau's critics in an attempt to ridicule the paper really, had suggested that it was based on metaphysical notions of the corporation in itself, sort of the Kantian notion of an corporation an sich, the thing in itself. Now, however, most scholars and the legislator did follow Rathenau in his assessment. And to this day, it's the notion of the corporation which limits the rights of both management and owners vis-a-vis -vis the corporation, and even recognizes a public duty to shield corporations from their pressures. Now, if we conceptualize the corporation as distinct from managers and owners, this allows us to superimpose, as it were, a layer beyond their self-interested goals. Now, this might be understood as open to encompassing both purpose and commitment, and it has been used to favor long-term over short-term goals, sustainability concerns, and stakeholder interests in German jurisprudence. There are obvious risks, such as the 1937 Corporation Law Call, decreeing that the corporation had to serve the German people and the Reich. Still, after World War II, the concept of the cooperation was used towards a reorientation to stakeholders, sort of similar to what we're talking about today. Its most famous example being the 1976 law, which introduced co-determination on boards for employees, which is an example Colin cites for communal commitment. My second question follows from there. Colin's suggestion to say goodbye to the dichotomy of principals and agents, management and owners. Will this lead to a new dichotomy between managers and owners on the one hand side and a value and purpose laden cooperation in itself on the other side? And if so, who gets to decide on that? Now, my last comment is about culture. I really like Colin's book, partly because it profited so enormously from the broad insights he has into history, economics, and the legal framework of Asia, Europe, and the US. And I've particularly enjoyed a part where he explains how financing structures of businesses have developed in Japan, UK, US, and Germany. He does portray my own country, interestingly, as not mainly bank finance, which is the traditional view. And he highlights instead the gatekeeper role which banks held and hold as to access and capital markets in many ways. Now, when, when I took part in the EU Commission's high level forum on the capital market union, I have witnessed countless discussions on how to incentivize Europeans both retail shareholders, larger shareholders, at times even institutional shareholders to invest some of their savings on capital markets. A recent study claims that only 9% of the adult population of the Euro area own publicly traded shares. In the US, to give another example, we're looking at 52%. But then again, whom to trust with financing your business or taking care of your savings has as much to do with habits, customs, and local practice as with rational rule-based decision-making on which financial economists often look to. And then confirmation bias, you see I'm more of a behavioralist, amplifies this tendency to stick to prior beliefs, even if there are evidence-based reasons to change course. 
And Colin does talk about some of these concerns when he ponders why, for example, scaling up startup companies in the EU is lagging behind the US. And he suggests a combination of private control with public markets as a remedy for that. And while this is doubtlessly an element which might contribute to the attractiveness of going public, my question is, are we not faced with a much larger cultural and behavioral problem, which might be caused by the lack of robust equity market traditions in Europe? To take a very different example, in the context of the Wirecard scandal, and Jennifer has already talked about scandal, so I take up this one, um, arguably the most important post-war financial scandal in Germany, a deficit in culture manifested in a different way namely in lack of oversight, accountability, and also teeth of the supervisor. And against this background and the role public policy plays in Colin's book, namely to promote corporate purposes, he says, through law, regulation, and taxation. Is this really in tune with culture? Or more importantly, can corporate purpose be a one-size-fits-all approach? I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Katja, for an uh, uh, excellent discussion. The, uh, we always uh, talk about Germany uh, when it comes to a similar kind of situation in Japan. So it's, it's, it has been very helpful. OK, so our final uh, commentator uh, will be uh, Professor Gen Goto uh, from the University of Tokyo Graduate School of, uh, for Law and Politics. Uh, we'd like to invite him for, for, from, for, to present the Japanese perspective on, the, uh, on this issue. Uh, Professor Goto, please. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Suzuki, uh, for this kind of introduction. And um, so uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so uh, this is my great uh, pleasure and honor to comment on uh, Professor Colin Mayer's book, uh, which I think is a very thought provoking one. And um, so um, let me just pull up my slides here. Uh, okay, so, um, so uh, well, we I think I do not have to repeat, but Professor Mayer's uh, main thesis uh, in his book is that corporations exist not for the financial interests of shareholders, but for the uh, purpose. And uh, from this, uh, it follows that directors have duty of loyalty toward the purpose of the corporation, not its shareholders. So this is uh, indeed a very new concept. And in contrast, uh, Japanese corporate law, uh, just like uh, many other jurisdictions law, uh, it follows a classic shareholder primacy model. So Companies Act uh, grants strong decision-making powers to shareholders and directors of Japanese companies have duty of loyalty towards uh, the interest of the company. But this interest of the company is uh, interpreted as the interest of shareholders as a class. However, um, it must be noted that directors have a wide discretion uh, under the business estimate rule uh, to take stakeholders' interest um, when doing so is necessary for the benefit of the company and its shareholders. So this position was in principle um, confirmed by our Supreme Court uh, back in 70s. And uh, well, Jennifer, refer to the debate between uh, professors Bali and Dodd and um, Katya also referred to uh, Watanath now. Well, we also had a similar discussion uh, about uh, companies um, or corporate social responsibility uh, in 1970s. Then uh, there was a proposal to introduce a director's general duty to promote CSR. And this was put on the reform agenda of the government council. But ultimately, uh, this was rejected. The reasons of the rejection were twofold. First, uh, it was said that there is a risk that directors uh, would pursue their own interest under the name of CSR because the concept of CSR is too vague, too broad, so managers can put in everything uh, in there. And secondly, uh, it was said that such general duty is unnecessary uh, because uh, directors may take stakeholders' interest uh, into consideration uh, when it is uh, beneficial for the company. So, um, so many um, 
many academics that were in uh, took place in this debate, but I think now uh, many people agree that uh, such general duty uh, is not necessary. But uh, so how would Professor Mayer um, would respond to these two arguments, uh, which was raised uh, in Japan back in 70s? Well, so based on uh, my reading of his book, uh, I think he would reply that, um, so this would not apply to um, his um, thesis because um, he requires that the companies to state its purpose in its articles of incorporation or articles of association. And such statement must be specific, clear, concrete, and should have measurable goals and targets. So this is more precise and concrete, and it's different from uh, the general duty discussed in Japan back in the 70s. So this would have more binding effect on the management, and management uh, cannot just put in uh, his own interest under the name of CSL. So with this, uh, it might be able to overcome the shortcomings uh, of the old Japanese proposal. But uh, even following uh, this approach, I still have uh, three uh, questions that I'd like to ask to Professor Mayer. So first, um, regards the uh, purpose of the corporation. So Colin suggests that um, this will be done. Uh, so the, my question is that who sets the purpose of the corporation and how, but under what procedure? So Colin suggests that uh, this will be done by uh, amending articles of association. But then uh, usually uh, it will be up to shareholders to uh, decide uh, whether or not to amend the articles of association. And usually it will be decided by the one share one vote principle, unless uh, shareholders decide to deviate from it. So. Uh, it's, uh, my question is, uh, is this the right understanding, correct understanding of your proposal, Professor Mayor? And um, if this is so, then uh, I think it kind of resembles the proposal raised by um, Professor Hart and Zingales a few years ago. They said that uh, shareholders should have, should be able to choose whether to pursue ESG or other agenda. And also it's similar to kind of uh, B Corps in US. Then, um, so this is actually not so new. I think this is kind of an enlightenment, uh, enlightened shareholder value approach. So uh, we are quite familiar with it. But then this means that shareholders might decide that their corporation's purpose should be actually maximization of their financial uh, interest. So my question is that, is this uh, acceptable to your uh, concept of new corporation? So if this is not acceptable, then um, I, I just, uh, oops, sorry, uh, I think uh, there was some confusion with the translation. So uh, if this is uh, the case, then uh, I, would, uh, I think that uh, there is more uh, issue with uh, what kind of uh, procedure that we want to take. Uh, uh, excuse me, sorry, I think the translation is kind of mixing up with the English. Um, my, is it okay to proceed? Okay, all right. So this is my, uh, thank you. So this is my uh, first question. The, my second question uh, is, so let's say that uh, a founder of a corporation had set a nice uh, purpose to serve the community or serve environment or uh, the employees, it's fine. But then he passes away uh, later on. Then in this case, who would be the monitor uh, whether the corporation or its management is complying with its purpose and uh, who would take enforcement actions uh, when necessary. So Professor Mayer suggests that a founder's family or something similar to uh, industry of foundations in continental Europe, their uh, board of trustees. So this might be one solution, but then the next question would be who would monitor these uh, agents? So this is a classic example of uh, agent watching agents. Maybe I'm still trapped in the world of uh, agency cost, but uh, this would be very important because, well, um, in Professor Mayer's book, uh, several examples of successful family farms or industrial foundations are given. 
But I believe that there are many cases uh, in which founders, family, or trustees have uh, not lived up to the expectations and they rather pursue their own uh, interest. And also uh, he suggests that cross shareholders in Japan had played a similar role, but I'm a bit skeptical here because well, they might have cared about their own business, their, their own interest and their own employees, but they may not have cared about other stakeholders, including environment. So, well, maybe uh, let's say the Tokyo Electric Power Plant Company, they might have been protected by some cross shareholdings, but I'm not sure whether they really uh, considered environment and other uh, stakeholders' interests seriously. And my final question, uh, this is from a somewhat different perspective. So uh, Professor Mayer uh, highly values founders' family as uh, using his term anchor shareholders who would provide stability of ownership and suggest to help these families maintain their control. So this could be, of course, one solution uh, to be a monitor of the management, fine. But uh, I, I'm afraid that this might mean that rich families uh, who owe their fortune uh, to their ancestors, not to themselves, uh, they uh, stay rich and powerful. So I felt some kind of uneasiness here because uh, this might lead to uh, increase, increasing or at least preserving uh, current economic and social disparity. So my, my final question that I would like to ask is so how would Professor Mayer's argument would be placed uh, in the context of these uh, economic and social disparity? Thank you so much and I'm looking forward to the discussions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Goto, uh, uh, for the excellent presentation from, from Japanese perspective. So I'll hand over to uh, Marco Becht, the familiar face uh, among the ECGI participants <laughs> uh, from University uh, Université Libre de Bruxelles uh, to hand over. Thank you. Thank you, Iko. So we'll have about uh, 10 minutes for an exchange, uh, which is not much. So I'll hand over immediately uh, to Colin uh, to respond, but let me maybe say two words why I think this is such an important debate. Because what we are really debating in this series and more broadly is really uh, a reflection on the type of capitalism that we want to live in. And I think this came through uh, very effectively in the session today with the comments that we had from Jennifer uh, Katya and Gen, really taking us back to the 20s and the 30s, uh, which is where a lot of this debate really originates. And let's uh, not forget that, you know, people like Lenin uh, also had things to say on the corporation. So it's really a question of what kind of capitalism do we want to live in? And of course, Germany at the time of Radna was the most cartelized uh, country in the world. Uh, so there's also something to say about that. Um, but before we delve into these things, and I don't think we can in 10 minutes, um, uh, let's just, uh, I just want to hand it back to Colin uh, to, to respond to some of the things that were said. And then we can, I'll take some questions uh, from Slido. And if you have other questions, please do post them in Slido. And people can also vote on the questions that appear there. So I get guidance which, you know, which questions the audience feel are the most important ones. Okay, Marco, thank you very much for that. And thank you very much indeed, uh, Jennifer, Katya, and Gen, for your uh, extremely helpful and insightful comments. They were all really excellent. I'll just pick up on a few. Uh, first of all, Jennifer's quite correct observation about the important role that corporate governance and stewardship codes play. Uh, and in that regard, the UK is an interesting model because through the 2018 corporate governance reforms and the 2020 stewardship code reforms, what it is attempting to do is indeed to place the notion of purpose more at the heart of business than the law itself does. Uh, and so, Principle two of the corporate governance code says that the directors of a company must establish its purpose, its strategy and values and ensure that they and its culture 
are aligned. And it goes on to say that the directors must measure the performance of the company uh, against its purpose and ensure that it has the necessary resources to deliver on it. Now that sums up very well what I was talking about in terms of uh, what is needed in terms of corporate governance code. Uh, and if in due course, the law is then aligned with that emphasis on purpose, indeed we will have a system that is placing purpose at the heart. Stewardship is extremely important in so far as what it brings out is the different role that different types of owners play. And what stewardship is doing is to really emphasize, as Jennifer was saying, uh, the significance that investors, institutional investors, are placing on social and climate factors and the way in which they're evaluating those in terms of the ESG uh, obligations of companies. So that element uh, is important in addressing some of the issues. It does not, however, uh, ensure that the investor community is doing what is needed from the point of view of promoting purpose. Uh, we've been involved in uh, uh, engaging with uh, around about 100 boards of companies in Europe and North America and institutional investors. And what comes out is a strong emphasis that many boards want to place on, uh, on their purpose. Uh, but finding that institutional investors uh, are uh, disinterested uh, in, in many cases in uh, the way in which companies are pursuing their purposes and don't believe that they're doing it and not measuring their performance against it. So there is a need for stewardship to really move in a direction of embedding purpose in the heart of what institutional investors are doing. Danone is extremely interesting because it brings out the notion that there's been a failure in terms of purpose and a shift back to the Freeman doctrine. In fact, it does exactly the opposite. It illustrates precisely the importance of what I'm talking about here in terms of purposes as being about producing profitable solutions. Uh, what Danone uh, did was to emphasize solutions, but not in the context of them being core to its business model in terms of producing profitable outcomes. And it seriously underperformed uh, its uh, main benchmarks in the form of, for example, Nestle and Unilever, uh, because uh, it uh, treated those issues as essentially cost centers rather than the ways of driving better business value. Katia's point about culture and one size fits all uh, is an extremely important one. And the whole objective of what is being talked about here is to avoid a one size fits all. Uh, and that comes to uh, Gen's uh, question about, well, who determines purpose? Is there the so-called purpose police uh, overseeing whether or not companies really are abiding by their purpose? And the answer is absolutely not. The notion of purpose here is something that is uh, one that is encouraging multiplicity and competition in purposes uh, with the idea that there should be competition to runs to the top in terms of the ways in which companies are solving problems and doing so in a profitable fashion, but in a form where those profits are not imposing detriments uh, to other parties. Uh, so that the culture is a, is a very important determinant of the way in which those uh, purposes are determined. And when companies start off, their founders are key to doing that. But uh, as those companies become larger, they lose those guiding principles that come from their founders. In larger listed companies, it's predominantly the executives and the boards of companies that are the parties that are responsible for determining those purposes. Now, does this then uh, allow companies, as again uh, asked, to maximize shareholder interests if they so wish? The answer is absolutely. If companies believe that, uh, for example, they're particularly dependent on financial capital and it's critical to their success, uh, that they promote their shareholder interest above everything else, uh, there is absolutely nothing in this to stop them from doing that. But the key element, and this is really comes to the core of the questions that Gen was raising about who 
monitors and uh, how does one determine whether or not companies are delivering on their purposes. The company has to then uh, make clear that that is what its purpose is, that it is not seeking to protect the interests or promote the benefit of other parties. In the case of other companies, they may wish to have different purposes. And that's what I mean by multiplicity. And for them, they have to demonstrate that they are, uh, that they have a structure and constitution in place to achieve those purposes. And they should set out how they're going to be monitored. What is going to be the role of the different stakeholders, for example, uh, in overseeing uh, the delivery of the purposes? How is the company going to measure its performance and report on the extent to which it's delivering its purpose? To what extent will different parties have uh, any uh, enforcement rights in terms of the way in which those uh, purposes are delivered uh, and remedial actions that need to be taken where there's a failure to do so. That is exactly what I'm talking about in terms of the defining of the constitution of the company. It is up to the company to demonstrate that its commitment to its purpose is credible. If it doesn't do that, quite legitimately, people shouldn't believe in it, and they shouldn't therefore place their faith and their trust in companies to uh, deliver on that. Do families create a conflict in terms of uh, wealth creation on their own part as against broader societal success? Absolutely, we've observed a lot of that in terms of some of the largest disparities arising from the wealth that's created from the founders and families uh, of, of companies. Now, uh, if it's the case that uh, that wealth generation has really been associated with societal uh, benefits in terms of uh, solving problems, it may well be justified. But families, like everyone else, needs to, need to be particularly aware uh, in this decade about the emphasis that is being placed on inclusivity and the issues and problems associated with inequality uh, and recognize that that in itself can be a problem that they are creating. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. So I'll turn straight to the uh, some of the questions that I'll pose to uh, to all of you, in fact, so let me start with maybe a more specific question on the topic of today, which is about, of course, fiduciary duties on the board, uh, which I think people have re been responding to. And the first question is from Sean Turnbull, who asks, well, you know, is this really a question of reforming uh, company law? Or, and I think Katya already mentioned this, is this really a question of uh, actually what kind of, uh, he calls it constitution, so what kind of original corporate charter you actually write and if you uh, care about these things and I think this is also um, people refer to the Hans Ingalis model you know if you take the perspective of a founder what stops you from writing uh, any of these things uh, into uh, the charter and if you do that then of course the directors that are being appointed to the board of that entity uh, automatically uh, have the duty uh, that you're looking for so why is that not uh, the solution or is that the solution uh, rather than um, reforming uh, company law as it exists in some form. Uh, so maybe I give this to Jennifer to start with. You, you can duck literally on the camera if you don't. <laughs> I may duck, I may duck. Um, well, I'm not quite sure. Uh, it, to, to a degree, this is what Colin's theory is is promoting the idea that you have your, your purpose, and I'd like to know the difference between purpose and values in the constitution. So is Shan's point more that we don't have to reform corporate law because it's all a matter of contract, people can put that in the constitution if they wish? I, th I think it's more a question for Colin, but when he says something, I might come back in again. Um, Colin, I'm dumping you in it now. Okay, no, that, that, that's absolutely fine because I think it's a key question. And the answer is uh, what uh, uh, Sean is, is, is promoting uh, is okay, but only up to a very limited point. And the, the problem that the notion that uh, the company can write its constitution 
is fine until the point that it's subject to a, uh, a bid by another company uh, or an engagement by an activist fund, uh, at which case there is no credibility to the commitment that the company can make because the new owners can require the company to shift direction appreciably. Uh, two cases illustrate that very well. One which I've mentioned already, uh, which is Danone. Uh, so uh, I said that it was uh, uh, an, an interesting case because it was underperforming um, and that, uh, that uh, stimulated the intervention. But what it also illustrates is that we have no idea now what the consequence of that is, whether or not it's simply that uh, it's going to improve its performance around the objectives that Danone has had in terms of promoting societal and environmental interest. We suspect that what's going to happen is it's going to emphasize shareholder interests uh, much more extensively, potentially at, at the expense of other parties. Now, uh, another, the second example I would give is the uh, uh, weekend bid that came in for, from Kraft for Unilever um, uh, that seriously dis deflected uh, Unilever from uh, its purpose um, and illustrated the fact that ultimately, so long as it's the case that the law merely states that the duties of directors is to pursue the success for the benefit of the shareholders, uh, shareholder value maximization trumps other things uh, once uh, activist interventions or, shareholder or, or acquisitions are possible. What is required is to put the notion of purpose so that companies can state their purpose and create a constitution that allows them to protect the interests of the parties that are supported by its purpose in the face of changes in ownership as well as anything else. That does not exist at present. Right, Ike, can I ask another question? One more question? Uh, we have three more minutes, or am I out of time? Yes, you can, please. Okay, so let me turn to Patrick Welte's question, which I think is really um, fundamental, because Patrick is asking that if this is, if, if a lot of this uh, is about pursuing the UN Sustainable Development Goals, uh, can we really, with uh, this purpose corporation, achieve, you know, even if the directors have all these fiduciary duties and all the rest of it, can we really achieve uh, these goals? So in other words, let me ask it differently. What is the demarcation line? And I think Jennifer alluded to this in the original Freeman quote. What's the demarcation line between the role of the private sector and the public sector. And Shan asked another question about the commons. If you think about things like forced labor, if you think about ocean fisheries, these kind of questions where you have big questions, um, can we really solve them, um, expect private enterprise to solve them? And even a well-meaning board, if your competitors um, are in fact not playing by the rules, uh, and this really goes back to the question that was raised before. Of course, if you have a cartelized, monopolized economy, then the solution is easy. And that, of course, is what Lenin was all about. You just then, you know, capture the executives and the board and tell them, this is your fiduciary duty, look after the workers. And that solves your solution. That's your solution. But of course, if you live in a competitive world and Rio Tinto is competing with other mining companies, that don't obey the rules, uh, it might not be so easy. So where is the line between what private enterprise can do and what governments need to do? Um, and I think I'll first, okay, I, I think I'm not dumping it on you, uh, uh, Jennifer. <laughs> I'll, give, I'll, give it to, I'll give it to Colin, but of course, anybody is welcome to come in on this as well, because I think it's a really, Patrick Velter's question is really very fundamental. It is very fundamental, and I've only got about 30 seconds in which to answer this fundamental question. So let me be very brief. Uh, and the answer is the whole objective behind this is let's make markets uh, uh, and the capitalist system work as effectively as we can in terms of solving 
public problems? How do we make it work as effectively as possible? Make sure that it doesn't create damage, okay? And it's created damage in large proportions as well as an immense amount of prosperity, growth, uh, and economic well-being. We need to be able to address that to ensure that it does as much as it can to solve our problems. And if we put the notion of solving problems at the heart of companies, then it will go a long way towards doing that. In particular, if we say that it, as a, uh, a, sec as, as a second part, it should not profit from producing problems, but it will not solve all problems. It cannot internalize all externalities. It has to work in partnership with the public sector and with governments. And we've seen that in spades over the last year in relation to the crisis. Uh, business is not larger than governments. Governments are inherently vital to solving our social health as well as environmental problems. What this does is it encourages a better partnership by essentially aligning interests of public and private and ensuring that there isn't the sort of conflicts that have arisen to date. Great. So I think uh, we are out of time. So all I can say as a consolation is there are three more episodes to come, <laughs> including one on, um, of course, uh, hedge fund activists and hostile takeovers next time, which I'm really excited about because I think I'm going to disagree quite a lot with Colin, which is always exciting. Uh, so with this, I hand back over to uh, Iko. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for uh, participating in this second episode of the uh, five-time uh, five-part series. And it was very uh, inspiring discussion, and I, I really learned a lot. So, uh, just a reminder that uh, there will be a third round uh, on May the twentieth, which has been determined. Uh, other dates will be announced uh, eventually. So. Uh, Please uh, keep updated and uh, please participate in the next round. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for coming and uh, wishing you, uh, hope to see you again uh, at the next round. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.